All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, once again, my name is Paul Dalva. I'm an NSF astronomy and astrophysics postdoctoral fellow at UC Riverside. And yes, today I'm gonna to be talking about a long period planet that actually transits. There are some of them. I know we've heard a lot just about short period exoplanets, but there are long period ones. And this uh, particular case study I'm gonna talk about, this planet is more akin to Jupiter and Saturn, cold Jupiter and Saturn than hot Jupiters. And so it's very, very rare. And I like to, to show this imagery from the Juno spacecraft of Jupiter. And I like to show pictures of Saturn from Cassini as well, just to sort of motivate efforts to push out to the, the long period end of exoplanetary systems, really to push our methods of detection and characterization for exoplanets to the cold outer regions. Now it's difficult to do and it's improbable, uh, but it is something that is, is certainly worth doing. Um, <clears throat> so before I actually get into talking about this planet that I'm, I'm really interested in, I'm gonna maybe get a groan when I show this slide and slides like this just one more time. Hopefully I can make a bit of a different point though for this. Uh, and it's really just that the sample of known exoplanets is extremely biased. Everything you're gonna see on this slide is very biased based on observational detection methods. Uh, so for this first plot, what I'm showing are uh, planet mass as a function of semi-major axis, and the points are known exoplanets. It's most of the known exoplanets, and they're colored by their discovery method. So not too surprisingly, what you see are a bunch of red points pretty close in. Those are the transiting planets. And um, moving a little bit further out, uh, you see the blue points, which are discovered via radial velocities, and there's a smattering of uh, green points in there from the microlensing planets. And then, of course, the very, very wide separations, you get the uh, imaging planets. Now, looking at Jupiter and Saturn that I have denoted there with the J and the S, you think, oh, this actually, you know, it's not so bad. We've got some planets. We're sort of getting into the Jupiter and Saturn uh, realm. But the issue here is that with the 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 uh, RV points and the imaging imaging points. Well, with the RV points, you can measure the mass, but you can't measure the radius. And so you're missing a fundamental piece of information. So unless it transits, you're sort of stopping right there. You just have the mass. Same with the microlensing planets. Now with the imaging planets, you can back out a radius from the spectra, but I would say the imaging planets are sort of a, a different epoch in time. Right now, directly imaged planets are all very hot. They're self-luminous. That's sort of where the method stops right now. So until direct imaging can move to the point where it can detect cold Jupiter planets, our best bet is with the transiting planets, trying to get those red points to move a little bit further out. So maybe the more important plot to show, uh, again, lots of biases from observational methods up here, is the second one, which is radius as a function of orbital period. And now you really see that when it comes to things that have had their radius measured and can possibly have their mass measured as well, Jupiter and Saturn are, are almost alone. But there are some data points. There are some points that are out here getting around a thousand days. It's not a hopeless case. And these are the ones that require a lot of attention and a lot of patience, but they're very much worth following up. So to, to argue that point a little bit more, uh, why bother with these long period transiting planets? Because they're, they're a pain. Uh, I'd say that the, the biggest argument for this is the prospect for atmosphere characterization of cold planets. Um, so with atmosphere characterization, you can do, you can, you can take the, the models and the chemistry that Julie just told us about, and you can apply them directly to these planets without very much uh, accounting for the fact that maybe these giant planets are really, really different than Jupiter. And you can almost do an apples to apples comparison. So think of how you can increase the dynamic range on studies of clouds or atmospheric chemistry or energy distributions or seasonality as a function of atmospheric temperature or stellar insulation. Also, uh, atmospheric characterization can reveal abundances or in exoplanet speak, metallicity. Uh, and this can inform your interior properties and your, possibly your formation histories of your planet. And uh, probably doesn't need to be said here at this conference, but Jupiter and Saturn need context. We want other Jupiter and Saturns that are like Jupiter and Saturn to help us understand the, the differences that we have in these two giant planets that are in our backyard. And it, moving towards the terrestrial planets too, inner potentially habitable planets, they need context as well. You wouldn't fully understand the habitability of the Earth and the, the development of it if you just looked at Earth with your blinders on. You have to see the entire system and you have to know how the Jovian planets are going to interact with your terrestrial planets. So. It's tough going to push the transit method out to hundreds and thousands of days, but there's scientific reason to do it. So let me uh, give you the case study of the planet that I think is the best uh, cold Jovian analog to actually start doing studies with. And it's Kepler-167e. And over here on the left, I've presented a, a bunch of different properties of this planet. 
Uh, it's about the size of Saturn with error bars more or less the size of Jupiter. Its orbital period is 1,071 days. I have to pause on that because that's a good two orders of magnitude more than your average transiting planet. So this is an exceptionally improbable find, uh, but there it is, and it transits its host star. Uh, it, uh, it has a uh, low eccent orbital eccentricity, which is really interesting because so does Jupiter. Uh, and its equilibrium temperature, for whatever that is worth, is on the order of about 130 Kelvin. So it's cold. It's properly cold. Uh, I, I loved the Venn diagram that Ravi showed that showed solar system exo-objects and insulation. And right at the center of that, Kepler 167e. There's, there's not another one like this. And uh, it, it was, uh, here are the two transits. It was discovered by the primary Kepler mission. Um, and there are transit models laid over there. That's just flux as a function of time. And so you can measure the mid-transit time of those two transits. You can subtract those values and boom, you've got an estimate of the orbital period of this planet. So that's great. Now you can go, go forth and observe future transits. But there's a problem. And this is a problem with every long period transiting planet that you're going to run into. And it's what I've highlighted in red down there at the bottom left. And it's transit timing variations. And with just two transits, you don't know if there are transit timing variations. Now, in general, for most exoplanets, short period ones, TTVs are, are awesome. They're a fantastic way to measure masses and characterize your system. I'm showing a plot here for a different exoplanet, Kepler-49c. It's got a period of 11 days. And uh, on the Y is the O minus C. So this is the difference from just a nice linear ephemeris that the transits show, uh, just as a function of time. And the sinusoidal pat pattern maps out the interactions between this planet and another planet in the system. And there's a whole lot of analytical formalism behind this. It's, it's a really uh, active area of exoplanet study. And it's great for short period planets when you can measure 100 transits in a row. But for long period transiting planets, it's a hindrance. TTVs from one transit to the next can be hours to days long. So if you write your James Webb proposal, well, I want to see the transit of Kepler 167e, it's going to occur Tuesday at 3 p.m. plus or minus four days. You're never going to win that time. You're not going to go fishing for transits with James Webb. And unfortunately, it seems like about 50% of Kepler's long period planets and candidates have TTVs that are this large. So it's a coin flip if you're going to go after future transits. So what that means is you have to conduct sort of high risk, high reward observations just to recover transits to try to then refine the uh, orbital ephemeris of the planet that you're interested in. So indeed, that's what I did uh, for this particular target, 167E. This was the timeline of events. Uh, two transits were observed by Kepler, 2010 and 2013, and then the Kepler primary mission ended. And so the third transit that occurred at some point in 2016 was missed. So flipping this coin, uh, if you say, if you, if you posit that there are no transit timing variations in this system, then you could predict pretty precisely that a transit should have occurred uh, in December, on December 14th of 2018. Now, for any observational uh, astronomer folks in here, uh, the Kepler field is in the constellation Cygnus, which is not something you want to go observing in December. Uh, so the best way to do this was from space, uh, which is harder to get time, especially for something high risk like this. Uh, but I managed to convince the Spitzer TAC to give us some time to look at it. And jumping right to the, the punchline, uh, our 10-hour Spitzer observation captured transit egress. So on the left, I'm showing our Spitzer data in various level, uh, levels of being processed. I specifically want to call out Patrick Tamburo, who's a Boston University grad student, who's uh, just a master of processing Spitzer data. So he was a key collaborator in working on this. Uh, on the top, you see raw with the model and all the systematic errors that come along with Spitzer data. But right there in the middle, what you see is a partial transit. You see starting with in transit, a nice clear egress, and then a nice out of transit baseline. And what this told us was the transit occurred on time as if there were no TTVs, which was the best possible outcome. Um, and uh, we were able to rule out transit timing variations of about an hour to five sigma, so we're in great shape. And so we plot these three transits we've now observed, and we fit a line to three data points. And uh, what we're able to do with that is then predict future transit times through 2030 uh, to better than six minutes. So future transit timing will not preclude future observations of transits of, of this planet. So that, all of that uncertainty is now gone from the ephemeris of the system and is now accessible to something like HST or James Webb, at least when it's far enough away from the sun that James Webb can get to it. So what might we expect to see if we do transmission spectroscopy of this planet? We've never done any uh, transmission spectroscopy of a cold gas giant planet like this. We don't necessarily know what to expect. 
So this is, these are a couple different transmission spectra. I should say that uh, regarding the mass of this planet, there isn't yet a published mass. It is something that is ongoing. Um, I am not the, the, the person leading that particular project, so I can't disclose too much about it, but it will be planetary. So this is not going to be a false positive, so no need to worry about that. So these are transmission spectra as a function of different masses. The mass plays into the surface gravity, which plays into the scale height, which affects the transmission spectral features. Um, the blue one would be the best case if this thing was about the mass of Saturn. Um, if you're not familiar with, with looking at transmission spectra all the time, uh, in higher values on the y-axis are mean more atmospheric opacity. So this is sort of like an upside down spectrum. So uh, these are exotransmit models from Eliza Kempton. And they show that you get this really uh, deep, uh, clear window into the atmosphere around five microns, which is what we would expect. Uh, and the other features are mostly due to methane. Uh, but with, with models, there are always things you have to, to make assumptions about. So these models ignore clouds, refraction, ice condensation, and molecular diffusion. So uh, perhaps a little, maybe perhaps a little bit of a more realistic transmission spectrum model would be coming off of Saturn. So this is what the transmission spectrum of Kepler-167e would look like if it was like Saturn. And this is coming from a study of Saturn as if, as if it were a transiting exoplanet. So as before, we have transit depth on the Y and wavelength on the X. And uh, the features you see, short blue word of about 3 micron, are pretty much all due to methane, which is what you would sort of expect and what we know to exist in Saturn. But the really, really exciting thing here is this whopping feature between 3 and 4 microns. This is a mix of methane, possibly ethane, and then bending modes of higher order al aliphatic hydrocarbons. This is your, your indicator of all the uh, photochemistry going on in Saturn's atmosphere. And if we were to see something similar, it would be identifying photochemistry in the atmosphere of this giant planet, which would be really, really exciting. And again, think of, think of them, the models that are based in the solar system that we could directly throw at this, even just with the detection, even if there were large error bars, it'd be unprecedented. Um, and on top of that, uh, the, the baseline of this spectrum isn't set by the cloud layer in, in Saturn's atmosphere. It's actually set by atmospheric refraction, which is sort of a second order effect that's generally thrown out for short period planets. But for longer period planets, it's not only important, but it's informative of the atmosphere. So this would unlock totally new windows and studies into uh, atmospheres of colder planets, colder exoplanets. So uh, I guess with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap up and just say that the characterization of long period mature giant planets in transit, though hard, really opens new windows to atmospheres, planet formations, system habitability, uh, solar system comparisons, and uh, exomoons. I will say with no, with no support for this, but I think the only uh, thing that would be more interesting than finding a moon in this particular system would be not finding a moon in this system, right? <laughs> So Kepler-167e, it's 130 Kelvin Jupiter analog. It's a really rare target, um, and I was very happy to share it today. And uh, I, I'm not trying to make the case that long period transiting planets are going to be the only way forward. Certainly direct imaging is going to be a, a very complementary once it gets to the point where it can detect light from cold Jupiters. But having a couple benchmark targets, even one or two, even just Kepler-167e, I think puts us in a great position to do more comparative uh, investigations in the future. So thank you.